Papa sat on a bench in the barn, his broken legs stretched awkwardly before him, mending one of Jack's harnesses. He had been there since early morning, a frown line carved deep into his forehead, quietly mending those things which needed mending. Mama told us not to bother him, and we stayed away from the barn as long as we could. But by late afternoon, we drifted naturally to it and began our chores. Papa had disappeared within himself, and he took no notice of us at first. But shortly afterward, he looked up, watching us closely. When the chores were almost finished, Mr. Morrison arrived from Strawberry, where he had gone to make the August mortgage payment. He entered the barn slowly and handed Papa an envelope. Papa glanced up questioningly, then ripped it open. As he read the letter, his jaw set tightly, and when he finished, he smashed his fist so hard against the bench that the boys and I stopped what we were doing, aware that something was terribly wrong. They tell you, he asked of Mr. Morrison, his voice curt and angry. Mr. Morrison nodded. I tried to get them to wait till after cotton picking, but they told me it was due and payable immediately. Them's they words. Carlin Granger, said Papa quietly. He reached for his cane and stood up. You feel up to going back to Strawberry tonight? I can make it, but I don't know if this old mule can. Then hitch Lady to it, he said, motioning to the mare. He turned then and went to the house. The boys and I followed, not quite sure of what was happening. Papa entered the kitchen. We stayed on the porch, peering through the screen. David, something the matter, son? The bank called up the note. I'm going to Strawberry. Called up the note, echoed Big Ma. Oh, Lord, not that, too. Mama stared at Papa, fear in her eyes. You going now? Now, he said, leaving the kitchen for their room. Mama's voice trailed him. David, it's too late. The bank's closed by now. You can't see anyone until morning. We could not hear Papa's reply, but Mama's voice rose sharply. You want to be out on that road again in the middle of the night after what happened? You want us worried to death about you? Mary, don't you understand? They're trying to take the land, Papa said, his voice rising too so that we heard. Don't you understand? I don't want you dead. We could hear nothing else, but a few minutes later, Papa came out and told Mr. Morrison to unhitch Lady. They would go to Strawberry in the morning. The next day, Papa and Mr. Morrison were gone before I arose. When they returned in the late afternoon, Papa sat wearily down at the kitchen table with Mr. Morrison beside him, rubbing his hand over his thick hair. He said, I called Hammer. What did you tell him? Mama asked, just that the note's been called. He said he'd get the money. How? He didn't say, and I didn't ask, just said he'd get it. And Mr. Higgins at the bank, David, said Big Ma, what'd he have to say? Said our credit's no good anymore. We aren't even hurting the Wallaces now, Mama said with acid anger. Harlan Granger's got no need. Bailey, you know he's got a need, Papa said, pulling her to him. He's got a need to show us where we stand in the scheme of things. He's got a powerful need to do that. Besides, he still wants this place. But son, the mortgage give us four more years. Papa laughed dryly. Mama, you want me to take it to court? Big Ma sighed and placed her hand on Papa's. What if Hammer can't get the money? Papa did not look at her, but at Mr. Morrison instead. Don't worry, Mama, we ain't gonna lose the land. Trust me. On the third Sunday of August, the annual revival began. Revivals were always very serious, yet, yet gay and long, and long planned for. Affairs which brought pots and pans from out of the way shelves, mothballs, packed dresses, and creased pants from hidden chests, and all the people from the community and the neighboring communities up to the winding Red School Road to Great Faith's Church. The revival ran for seven days, and it was an occasion everyone looked forward to, for it was more than just search services. It was the year's only planned social event, disrupting the humdrum of everyday country life. Teenagers courted openly. Adults met with relatives and friends they had not seen since the previous years. Big meeting, and children ran almost free. As far as I was concerned, the best part of the revival was the very first day. After the first of three services was, was dismissed, the mass of humanity, which had squished its way into the sweltering interior of the small church, poured onto the school grounds. 
and the women proudly set out their dinners in the backs of wagons and on the long black on the long tables circling the church. Then it was a feast to remember, brimming bowls of turnip greens and black-eyed peas with ham hocks, thick slices of last winter's sugar-cured ham, and strips of broiled ribs, crisply fried chicken, and morsels of golden squirrel and rabbit, flaky buttermilk biscuits and crusty cornbread, fat slabs of sweet potato pie and butter pound cakes, and so much more were all for the taking. No matter how long the pantry supplies, each family always managed to contribute something. And as the churchgoers made the rounds from table to table, hard times were forgotten, at least for the day. The boys and I had just loaded our plates for the first time and taken seats under an old walnut when Stacy put down his plate and stood up again. What's the matter, I asked, stuffing my mouth with cornbread. Stacy frowned into the sun. That man walking up the road. I took a moment to look up, then picked up my drumstick. So, he looks like Uncle Hammer, he cried and dashed away. I hesitated watching him, reluctant to leave my plate unless it really was Uncle Hammer. When Stacy reached the man and hugged him, I put the plate down and ran across the lawn to the road. Christopher John with his plate still in hand and little man ran after me. Uncle Hammer, where's your car? Little man asked after we all had hugged him. Sold it, he said. Sold it, we cried in unison. But why, asked Stacy, needed the money. Uncle Hammer said flatly. As we neared the church, Papa met us and embraced Uncle Hammer. I wasn't expecting you to come all the way down here. You expected me to send that much money by mail? Could have wired it, don't trust that either. How'd you get it? Borrowed some of it, sold a few things, he said with a shrug. Then he nodded toward Papa's leg. How'd you do that? Papa's eyes met Uncle Hammer's and he smiled faintly. I was sort of hoping you wouldn't ask that. Uh-huh. Papa, I said, Uncle Hammer sold the Packard. Papa's smile faded. I didn't mean for that to happen, Hammer. Uncle Hammer put his arm around Papa. What good's a car? It can't grow cotton, you can't build a home on it, and you can't raise four fine babies in it. Papa nodded, understanding. Now, you gonna tell me about that leg? Papa stared at the milling throng of people around the dinner tables. Let's get you something to eat first, he said. Then I'll tell you. Maybe it'll set better with some of this good food in your stomach. Because Uncle Hammer was leaving early Monday morning, the boys and I were allowed to stay up much later than usual to be with him. Long hours after we should have been in bed, we sat on the front porch lit only by the whiteness of the full moon and listened to the comforting sounds of Papa's and Uncle Hammer's voices mingling once again. We'll go up to Strawberry and make the payment first thing tomorrow, said Papa. I don't think I'd better go all the way to Vicksburg with his leg, but Mr. Morrison will take you there, see you to the train. He don't have to do that, replied Uncle Hammer. I can make it to Vicksburg all right, but I'd rest easier if I knew you was on that train headed due north, not off getting yourself ready to do something foolish. Uncle Hammer grunted. There ain't a thing foolish to what I'd like to do to them Wallaces. Harlan Granger either. There was nothing to say to how he felt, and no one tried. What you plan to do for money? Uncle Hammer asked after a while. The cotton looks good, said Papa. We do well on it. We'll make out all right. Uncle Hammer was quiet a moment before he observed. Just tightening the belt some more, huh? When Papa did not answer, Uncle Hammer said, Maybe I better stay. No, said Papa adamantly. You do better in Chicago. May do better, but I worry a lot. He paused, pulling out his ear. Come through Strawberry with a fellow from up in Vicksburg. Things seemed worse than usual up there. It gets hot like this and folks get dissatisfied with life. They start looking around for somebody to take it out on. I don't want it to be you. I don't think it will be, said Papa, unless you stay. In the morning after the men had gone, Big Ma said to Mama, I sure wish Hammer could have stayed longer. It's better he went, said Mama. Big Ma nodded, I know. Things like they is, it don't take but a little of nothing to set things off, and Hammer with that temper, he could do it. Still, she murmured wistfully, I sure wish he could have stayed. 
On the last night of the revival, the sky took on a strange yellowish cast. The air felt close, suffocating, and no wind stirred. What do you think, David? Mama asked as she and Papa stood on the front porch looking at the sky. You think we should go? Papa leaned against his cane. It's going to storm all right, but it may not come till late on over in the night. They decided we would go. Most other families had come to the same decision, for the church grounds were crowded with wagons when we arrived. Brother Logan, one of the deacons, called as Papa stepped awkwardly down from the wagon. Reverend Gapson wants us to get, the, to get the meeting started soon, soon as we can so we can dismiss early and get on home for the storm hits. All right, Papa said, directing us toward the church. But as we neared the building, we were stopped by the lanyards. As the grown-ups talked, little Willie Wiggins and Mo Turner, standing with several other boys, motioned to Stacy from the road. Stacy wandered away to speak to them, and Christopher John, little man, and I went too. Guess who we seen, said little Willie, as Stacy walked up. But before Stacy could venture a guess, little Willie answered his own question. TJ and them Sims brothers. Where? asked Stacy. Over there, little Willie pointed. They parked by the classrooms. Look, here they come. All eyes follow the direction of little Willie's finger. Through the settling dusk, three figures ambled with assurance across the wide lawn. The two Simpsons on the outside, TJ in the middle. How come he bring them here? Asked Mo Turner angrily. Stacy shrugged. Don't know, but I guess we'll find out. He looks different, I remarked when I could see TJ more distinctly. He was dressed in a pair of long, unpatched trousers, and as sticky hot as it was, he wore a suit, coat, and a tie, and a hat cocked jauntily to one side. I suppose he do look different, murmured Bo bitterly. I'd look different, too, if I'd been busy stealing other folks' stuff. Well, 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 what we got here, exclaimed TJ loudly as he approached. Y'all going to welcome us to y'all's revival services? What you doing here, TJ, Stacy asked. TJ laughed. I got a right to come to my own church, ain't I? See all my old friends. His eyes wandered over the group, but no one showed signs of being glad to see him. His wide grin shrank a little. Then spying me, he patted my face with his moist hand. Hey, Cassie girl, how you doing? I slapped his hand away. Don't you come messing with me, TJ, I warned. Again, he laughed, then said soberly, well, this is a fine how do you do. I come all the way over here to introduce my friends R.W. and Melvin to y'all, and y'all acting like y'all ain't got no manners at all. Yeah, O.R.W. and Melvin, he said, rolling the Simpsons, name slowly off his tongue to bring to our attention that he had not bothered to place a mister before either. They've been mighty fine friends to me, better than any of y'all. Look, see here what they give me? Proudly, he tucked at the suit coat. Pretty nice stuff, huh? Everything I want, they give me, because they really likes me. I'm their best friend. He turned to the Simpsons. Ain't that right, R.W. Melvin? Melvin nodded, a condescending smirk on his face, which was lost on TJ. Anything, just anything at all I want, they'll get it for me, including, he hesitated, as if he were unsure whether or not he was going too far, then plunged on, including that pearl-handled pistol and Barnett's mercantile. R.W. stepped forward and slapped a reassuring hand on T.J.'s shoulder. That's right, T.J., you name it and you got it. T.J. grinned widely. Stacy turned away in disgust. Come on, he said. Service is about to start. Hey, what's the matter with y'all? T.J. yelled as the group turned in mass and headed for the church. I glanced back at him. Was he really such a fool? All right, T.J., said Melvin as we walked away. We come down here like you asked. Now you come on into Strawberry with us like you promised. It, it didn't even make no difference, muttered TJ. What, said RW, you coming, ain't you? You still want that pearl-handled pistol, don't you? Yeah, but then come on, he ordered, turning with Melvin and heading for the pickup. But TJ did not follow immediately. He remained standing in the middle of the compound, his face puzzled and undecided. I had never seen him look more desolately alone, and for a fleeting second, I felt almost sorry for him. When I reached the church steps, I looked back again. 
TJ was still there, an indistinct blur blending into the gathering dusk. And I began to think that perhaps he would not go with the Simpsons. But then the rude squawk of the truck's horn blasted the quiet evening, and TJ turned his back on us and fled across the field. <laughs>